it should be. Amen. Father, we come to you tonight. We thank you for the opportunity to gather. We pray, Lord, that you would minister to us through this word. Bless this time that we have together, Lord, and we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. So we're going to finish up 1 Peter chapter 5 tonight. We're going to be in uh, verse, uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. And we'll be finishing up 1 Peter, and next week we'll get into 2 Peter, and we'll be in there for probably three or four weeks, and then we'll figure something else out to share on Wednesday night. Amen? The title in my Bible says, To the Elders and the Flock. To the Elders and the Flock. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. To the elders among you I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being an example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourself with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, and he will lift you up in due time. Call, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will, him, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. With the help of Silas, whom I regard a faithful brother, I have written you briefly, encouraging you to testify that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm. Stand fast in it. Amen? Stand fast in it. So back to 1 Peter 1 there. Or excuse me, there's, there's 13. So who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. So back to verse 1 there. It says, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. So he said there, to the elders among you, meaning more than one. That was a plural statement, meaning there's more than one, and there should be more than one elder, right? There's, in our church, we have four elders. The word elder emphasizes, it emphasizes their spiritual maturity. Men who have been proven in the things of the Lord. Or in our case, back 10 years ago when I took over pastoring the church, we had a church that was run by women. <laughs> and so the first thing that I got to do as a pastor was get rid of my wife, get rid of my sister, get rid of a couple other ladies that were on the leadership committee of the church, you would say. It wasn't really doctrinal. It wasn't ran the way it should be with men of uh, elders. So what I had to do at that time was look around the church and find the most spiritual men that were there. Right? So sometimes you're when this thing happens, you've got to go with what you got. You know what I mean? So I chose who, who had been there the longest, who had been there with me the longest, and uh, we started off uh, running the church with elders as you should have uh, been, right? So it's not just the pastor who makes the decisions of the church, it's the elders. Pastor being one of them. I'm a, a pastor of Turning Point Life Center, but I'm also an elder. Rudy Garcia is a pastor, but he's also an elder. Jim Prem, or, uh, Louis Barajas is an elder at Turning Point Life Center. Actually, we just have three right now because pa Pastor Bobby has moved on. But Pastor Bobby was a pastor, and he was also an elder, right? So, uh, but I'm, a, I'm an elder just like them. Uh, I don't trip. You know, I'm not one of those guys that trips out on the term pastor. Most of the guys in the men's home know I've never ever told anyone to acknowledge me as Pastor Norm. Uh, I, I just don't trip out on that. You know what I mean? Some people, they like to have that respect. It doesn't really matter to me because I'm just an elder like the rest of the guys that are elders. Amen? 
uh, but it, it's more than one, and the elders are the ones that make the decisions in the church. And the majority of the time, the pastor gets the rap for when the church fails. If this church ever fails, I'll get the rap. I'll, I'll be the one that goes down with the ship. But the majority of the time, the reason a church fails is not because of the pastor. It's because of those other elders that are in the leadership role that don't have the same vision as the pastor. Yeah, the pastor, might, the Lord might speak to me a little bit differently than he speaks to the other elders because uh, I'm in a teaching role in the church. But a lot of times the church will fail and the pastor will take the rap for it when it's really, uh, there's some elders that just don't have it going on. They're not, they're not with the Lord. They're not seeking the Lord like they should. I know multiple churches in the valley that keep having problems getting pastors. They'll get a pastor, he'll stay a year or two, and then he's out of there. First chance he gets, he runs out the door because of the elders. Because, you know, most elders have been with the church for a long time, and they like to do things the way they used to do them 30 years ago. Well, I'm going to tell you something. You can't run a church uh, the way you ran it 30, 40 years ago. Not saying that you, the doctrine is the same and everything else is the same, but you have to approach things a little bit differently than you did back then. Uh, if not, you won't have a newer generation coming up in your church. And so that's the problem with some of the things that I've seen with some churches, and, and, and they just can't keep a pastor because they don't want to make the changes that need to be made uh, to keep the church growing. The, ch the church has constantly got to be growing. you constantly got to be bringing people in because there's constantly going to be people leaving. Someone's going to get offended. Someone's going to say something offensive. So they're going to leave. They're going to go somewhere else. And then later on, they'll get offended somewhere else and leave. And they don't understand. You, you know, you, you, you get you a place, get you a church, and get grounded in it, and go through the fire. Amen. Go through what you got to go through. Uh, you're going to get rubbed wrong at times. I might rub you wrong at times. Someone, My wife might rub you wrong. Someone else here might rub you wrong. Anywhere you go, you're going to get rubbed wrong. Until you get your heart right with the Lord, you're going to get rubbed wrong. And once you get your heart right with the Lord, then you're going to learn to receive that. Right? And not saying that every time that someone rub, rubs you wrong, it's your fault. There's times I've rubbed people wrong and it's been my fault. Right? But, uh, and I talked about it Sunday, but you, you talked about church unity. You'll be able to go to someone and say, hey, look, man, you rubbed me wrong. And that person will say, oh, you know what? Man, I received that. Or if the person, most of the time with me, uh, if I rub someone wrong, I'll go to them and say, hey, look, man, I might have rubbed you wrong, man. I want to apologize to you just in case you didn't accept, you know, receive that the way that, that it was meant. You know what I mean? So, you know, but it says there, I appeal as a fellow elder. So Peter introduced himself in this letter, not as an apostle, not as some great spiritual leader, but as a fellow elder, simply one of the other elders, right? He wasn't trying to put himself on no pedestal. He was just, I appeal to you as a fellow elder. However, he did mention the fact that he had personally witnessed Christ's suffering. He said, and a witness of Christ's suffering. So we know that he walked with Christ. We know that he denied Christ. We know that he's seen what happened to Christ. He's seen him carrying that cross. He's seen the suffering that was laid upon our Lord and Savior. He witnessed it. He bore witness to it. And a lot of these folks, uh, there, there was a handful that did, but a lot of these that he's talking to here might not have. 1 Peter 5, 2 and 3, be shepherds of God's flock, that is under you, under your care, watch over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock, right? Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. So a shepherd's main responsibility is, is feeding the sheep, right? Is tending to the sheep. And the elder's responsibility is, is to the church. An elder's responsibility would be teaching to a church. There, there isn't an elder in our church who at any given time couldn't get up behind the pulpit and minister the word of God. Amen. They should be able to do that. I should. Louis gets up at the pulpit in Holbill. He ministers to the men. He, he, he does Bible studies at the men's home. Pastor Rudy's preaching on Tuesday night. Uh, I'm preaching. Uh, when Bobby was there, he was preaching. And Bobby's still preaching for Turning Point on Saturday night. Amen. Thank you, He's still a pastor in this church. Still pastoring. <laughs> all the way from Turlock. Amen. You know what I mean? 1 Timothy 3, 2. Now the overseers is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Right? Able to teach. So if they're an elder in the church, there must be spiritual maturity. There must be an ability to be able to teach the word of God. How can you be an overseer? How can you be an example? How can you be an influence if you yourself aren't able to open up the word of God or whatever God said in your heart and teach that to somebody else? That's how disciples are made. And an elder should be a disciple. He's been discipled by somebody 
to the point to where he's now in a leadership role in the church, and his job is to make disciples. His job is to take that and pour that into someone else. One uh, Titus 1 9 says, He must hold firmly to a trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. So an elder's got to know sound doctrine. An elder's got to be solid in the word. And he's got to be able to take that word and teach that word. And he's got to be able to defend the word of God. Peter at 5 2 said, Watching over them. Acts 20, 28 says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Be shepherds. It's not just my responsibility to shepherd the church, right? It's Pastor Rudy's responsibility. It's Brother Louis' responsibility to shepherd the church. Then you have people that are deacons. We have some deacons in our church. And I would guess when, if you're in a deaconship position, I guess one day uh, your goal would be to make it to an elder, to make it to a place. The deacon handles the responsibility, say, of, of what's going on physically here, maybe the lining of the chairs or fixing the building, whatever. The elders handle what's going on spiritually. So I imagine as you're a deacon, one day you would be, uh, your goal would be to be an elder. Or unless you just want to be a deacon. You don't, you don't want to get into that. But hey, I mean, God will promote you. Right? I went from the men's home to the pulpit. Ten years ago, December. Almost ten years now, uh, this December. Uh, that's what God's plan was for me. I, I kind of went over some of that elder stuff and just went straight to preaching because there was no one else there to step up. First Peter 5, 2. Not because you must, but because you are willing. And as an elder, you've got to be willing to go the extra mile. Me sitting there, well, when my pastor was sick, dying of cancer... Guest speaker after guest speaker after guest speaker. So many people had left the church. I was about to get in line with them. Right? So, man, I about had enough of this, man. And the Lord rebuked me in my spirit and said, you've been here long enough. Why don't you get up and preach? So that was the point when I had a one of my points or one of my points in my life in my walk with the Lord. I talked about you got to make a statement of faith. You got to you got to be all in. And I, and I was all in. Within like four hours of the Holy Spirit speaking to me in the church service of that, that afternoon, that Sunday afternoon, I called my pastor and I told him, look, I'm going to start preaching. And he was like, right on. When you start? I got this guy for two more Sundays. And I said, well, when he's done, then I'll start. It gives me a couple weeks to come up with something. <laughs> right? But I was willing. Yeah. Right? I was willing. The Holy Spirit spoke to me and I was willing to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. You don't do it because it's part of a job description of an elder. Not because you must, right? It said. You do it because you love God. You do it because you love God. Pastor Rudy goes out to the streets on Sunday evening with the outreach team because he loves God. Brother Louie does everything. He was just at my mom's house a couple hours ago moving furniture into my mom's house. He does that because he loves God. That's why you do it. Uh, and, and there's going to be people that you, know, you find hard to love sometimes, but you got to love them, right? But you do it because you love God. You don't do it for the pay. You don't do it. I mean, I don't do it so someone can call me pastor. I do it because I love God. I do it because I know what God's done in my life. And I'm grateful and thankful that I'm not strung out on drugs anymore. I'm grateful and thankful that I'm not in a coffin or in a, in a prison cell. And I, and I give God all the glory for that. So I'll do what I got to do because I love God until Jesus comes for me, right? Or until I go be with him. I do it because I love him. 1 Peter 5, 3, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. So we, we who are elders are called to be an example to those around us in all areas of our life. And, you know, you might be thinking, man, God's asking a lot of me to be an example. But, you know, he's calling every one of us to be an example. Amen. He's calling every one of us to be a salt of the earth. He's calling every one of us to be a shining light. Ain't no different than what he's calling you to be. He's calling all of us to go out there and share the word of God. Right? He's calling all of us to do all that stuff. 1 Timothy 5.17 The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worth double honor. Especially those who work in preaching and teaching. So those who work in preaching or teaching are worth double honor, he says. Double honor should be shown to them. Amen. 1 Peter 5.4 and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory 
that will never fade away. We know the chief shepherd is Jesus. Yeah. We all will receive according to what we've done. We know that. We know he, the, the scripture says there's a crown that will never spoil, never tarnish, never fade. 1 Corinthians 9.25 says everyone who competes in the game goes through strict training. They do it to get a crown that will, will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. That's the whole purpose of this. The whole purpose of walking in obedience to the Lord, whatever position he has you in. I don't care what it is. Whatever your gift is, whatever you're using it for to build up others, not to bring any glory to yourself, it might be whatever. It's to, to get that crown. You, 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 you got what he's given you. You're using it. It doesn't matter if it's for 25, 30, 40 years. You're going to work, walk that thing out, and one day you're going to receive the reward. Yeah. Right? That's why we celebrate when one of our brothers and sisters have gone home, home to be with with the Lord. Yeah, we'll miss them here on earth, but we celebrate, right? Yeah. My mother-in-law just passed, Carolyn, and we celebrate. Got to baptize her a couple years ago. Yeah. She's Lord. all frail. She got down in that swimming pool, man. Yeah. That's how bad she wanted to get baptized. Yeah. And we, it took us longer to get her in the pool than it did to dunk her. Yeah. But she wanted in that thing. I said, man, it's cold. I want down in there. Yeah. I want to get baptized. Yeah. 83 or 4 years old or whatever it was, she got baptized. Yeah. Right? And she's with the Lord. Amen. And that's what it's all about. That, that's what we're all trying to get. First Peter 5, 5 and 6. In the same way, you who are younger, listen up, you who are younger, submit yourself to your elder. All of you clothe yourself with humility toward one another. Because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, and he will lift you up in due time, right? Amen. So he's talking about those who are younger, whether in years or in faith, should submit to the elders. Why? Because the elders are the overseers. They have wisdom that comes from years of experience in the Lord. You might be 80 years old, but you might have only been in the Lord five years. Your pastor might be 30 years old, but he's been in the Lord 20, you know, whatever. You submit to him. He might have more experience. He said all believers should clothe themselves with humility. Put it on. Exercise that in your life. Clothe yourself with humility. Pride is a problem from the very beginning. Pride is the reason that hell was created for Satan and his demons. And pride's been the problem all along. And pride's the number one problem with division in the church is pride. Pride and personal gain. Don't be prideful. The opposite of prideful is humble. So either you're one or the other. I would ask you tonight, what are you? Are you too proud to go to someone and say, hey, I blew it? Are you, are you too proud to walk out that scripture, Matthew 5, 23 and 4, if you know that someone has something against you? Leave your gift at the altar. Therefore, go and get reconciled to your brother and sister. Then come back and offer your gift. If you're not willing to do that, you're prideful. And if you're prideful, God can't use you. And if you're prideful, you're not going to represent him the way that you should, to the best of your ability. Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, and he will lift you up in due time. Right? Matthew 23, 12, for those who exalt themselves will be humble. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. So we not only practice humility to one another, but we also humble ourselves to the Lord. It takes a humble man to get on his knees and cry out to God and say, look, Lord, I blew it, right? we got to humble ourselves. Submission is the key to Christian life. You have to be willing to submit to the Lord, first and foremost, because you'll never be able to submit to an elder if you can't submit to the Lord. You'll never be able to love a person the way you should if you can't love the Lord the way you should. And then you submit to those in your church, your leaders, you submit to your boss, wives, you submit to your husband. Right? you got to learn to submit. That you may be lifted up in due time. When God thinks you're ready, he'll lift you up. Some of you are waiting to get lifted up. Some of you are in a situation, Lord, when are you going to lift me up? When you humble yourself. And you're just right there, kind of that holding pattern. Oh, Lord, I'm waiting, but wait, you're not ready. You're too focused on getting lifted up instead of focused on submitting to me and surrendering to me and Everything that comes along with you being there where you're at. 1 Peter 5, 7. 
God's going to make sure you get the blessings that are coming your way. If you put yourself in a position to be blessed. Many of us have walked by and have let blessings pass us by. I've let them in my life. That ain't coming back. It's that one, here it comes, and I, I talked about it a couple sessions ago. I wasn't lined up with it, and it went right on by. It's like, man, there it went. And that, that thing's gone. There ain't no getting it back. And there's other ones coming. Are you, are you lined up? Where you need to be, or are you here? 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So when we fail to cast our anxiety on him and give all our worries to God, we're telling him that we don't trust him fully in our life. That's what you're telling them. That's where humility comes in. It takes a uh, someone to be show humility to realize their dependence upon the Lord. And if you, if you don't realize that, you're not humble. To, to say, Lord, get God involved in every situation and decision in your life. Cast me to distance those things. When you cast a fishing line out, you cast it out there. You get it as far away from you as you can. You distance it from you. You give it to the Lord. Lord God, here they are. Here's my worries. Here's my troubles. Lord, I know you're in control. I'm just going to give them to you and be done with it. Go on and live my life and do what I'm supposed to do for you. And you can have those things. But we fail to do that sometimes. Psalms 55, 22, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Some of you are sitting in here tonight with some things that you need to give to the Lord. Some of you walked in this place, some of the folks that might be tuned in online have some things that they need to give to the Lord. Leave them here with him tonight. Don't load them up in your car or take them home with you. How many times have you walked in church with something that you needed to leave at that altar? Even though you can't physically come to the altar, you're in the house of God. You can leave it right there where you sit. And how many times have you left with it? Leave it here. I would be honest enough to say that pretty much every time I walk in this building or in Hopeville, I leave something here. Pretty much every time. I have something that's bothering me, something that's on my mind, something that I can't control, and I just got to leave it here. Because if I don't, and I take it home, it's going to affect my home life. I'm going to wake up with it tomorrow, thinking about it, right? I just leave it right here. Lord God, deal with it. I can't worry about it. I'm casting my cares on you. I'm doing what the scripture says. I'm casting it on you. Here you go, Lord. It's yours. You paid the price for it here. Boom. I'm not going to worry about it. First Peter 5.8, this popular verse, right? Be alert in a sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Right. Be of alert and sober mind, right? So just because we have faith and trust in God, control and everything, doesn't mean we don't need to be alert. You have an enemy, and it's not your neighbor, it's not your boss, it's not Trump, it's not Biden, it's not none of that. It's the devil. And he has one agenda, and that's to take you down, take your family down, take your finances down, take your marriage down, take your ministry down, take anything down that's, that has any, shows any glory, points anybody to Christ. That's his goal. And if you're not saved or born again, to take you out, take you straight to hell. And if you are saved and born again, he'd like to take you out anyway, so that would be a few less souls that make it to heaven with you gone. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's set right outside that door waiting for you. He might even be sitting in here amongst us tonight. He's waiting for you to slip up. He's been shooting things at you constantly, waiting for you to slip up and just bite. And he's ready to pounce. Job 1.7, the Lord said to Satan, where are you coming from? Satan answered, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Satan will do whatever it takes to drag you out of fellowship with God. He will do whatever it takes to drag you away. I say it all the time, he gets you away from the brothers. He gets you away, he gets you isolated. He gets you out in the deep water. And then he takes you down. And you might scream for help then and there's nobody around because you've got to push everyone away. 
You stop returning text messages. Church called you where you've been. Hey, what's going on? You stop responding. He, someone might have said something to you the last time you were at church, and he just used that, and he just played it over your mind, and he took it, twisted it into something, and I'm never going back there, and he's doing his job. The heck with those Christians. I don't have to go to church. I can, I'll watch TV church. When the scripture says, don't fall out of fellowship. He makes you think that you have a reason to isolate yourself from the body of Christ. And he has you. Prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. 2 Corinthians 2.11 In order that Satan might not outwit us, we are not unaware of his schemes. You need to be aware of his schemes. You need to be aware of the toolbox that he has. You need to be aware of the resources and things at his disposal that he can use. And some of it Things that he uses in your life are, are close to you. Could be family and friends, whatever. He uses those things in your life to slowly pull you away. Little distraction here or there to keep you out of fellowship. Whatever he can do to keep you from reading the Word of God. Whatever he can do, he's just slowly at work all the time. He never stops. You need to always be praying, Lord, put a hedge of protection around me. You need to always be knowing that you do have an enemy. It'd just be, it'd be like Brendan going over to Afghanistan where he was at over there driving a tank and just one day thinking, oh, I can go out here without my bulletproof vest on. I don't need to worry about no Afghanis trying to kill me today. That ain't going to happen over there, right? Those troops, man, when they leave there, they're locked and loaded and they leave the gates of that compound they're on, wherever they're going, they're on high alert. Because there's an enemy out there that wants to take them out. We need to be on high alert. Because we all have an enemy, and his name is the devil, and he wants to take you out. <clears throat> Be on alert. 5 9 says, Resisting him, standing firm in the faith. Because you know the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. Standing firm in the faith. Don't let anything, let that foundation be on the rock of Jesus Christ that will withstand any storm. Adding to your faith daily, adding to all this stuff. Standing firm, right? Person standing firm in the faith is reading their word, they're praying, they're going to church, they're serving God. Jesus is first in their life. He has their whole heart. He's not second. Standing firm in the faith, Lord God, I know that I know that no matter what I'm going through right now, whatever trial I'm in, Lord God, I know that you're with me. Amen. Not no whimpering and crying, oh, I can't believe what is happening to me. Man, God, you're with me. Amen. I'm going to get through this, Lord. Amen. Standing firm. James 4, 7, submit yourselves into God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Amen. But you've got to be humble to submit to God. Right? 5, 9 said, because you know the family of believers throughout the whole world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. See, one of Satan's devices is to discourage us to think that we're the only one going through something. That's what he'll use all you. You're the only one. No, everybody's going through something. Everybody in here's got something that they're going on in their life that they wish it wasn't going on. Some of us have multiple things that we're dealing with that we'd rather not be dealing with. But whatever we're dealing with in our life, we need to make sure that we glorify the Lord to the best of our ability in it. And when you do it with a smile on your face and when you keep in the word and you keep coming to church and you keep serving God, you kind of give Satan the finger. In the Christian way. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you're kind of giving them the finger. When you read your word, you're giving Satan the finger. Not today, Satan. Tonight we're at church, we're giving them the finger, right? The Christian finger. Not today, Satan. <laughs> right? See, when you're struggling, you need to let somebody know. You need to reach out for prayer. I just seen online a... a a lot of folks, his friend around here, a poor woman uh, committed suicide. Sad situation. She's gone. Don't let it ever get to that point in your life. Right? That happens every day, multiple times a day across our nation. I mean, thousands of veterans have committed suicide. Every 44 seconds. Every 44 seconds. Wow. Enemy would want you to think that you're all alone, that no one cares. First and foremost, we know that God cares. Amen. Amen. That he, he loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus to pay the price that we would never have to be separated from him. Amen? Amen? Amen. So if you know someone that's struggling like that, man, make sure that they know that you're there for them. Amen. Make the extra effort to reach out to them. 
Let somebody know, because when you let somebody know, you're just putting on that armor, you're bringing in reinforcements, right? You're getting you some help. You get some people praying for you. You get some people to gather around you. Right? 510. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. So our God, my God, your God is a God full of grace, mercy, compassion for his children, like any father would be, right? It says, who has called you to his eternal glory. 1 Corinthians 1, 9, God is faithful, who has called you into a fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And when Jesus was born that day in the manger, God started calling his people. And as he grew up and he was baptized by John in the Jordan River, that echo of calling was going out. God continues to call his people. God's calling some people tonight. Look, humble yourself. Look, seek me out. Put me first, right? The calling continues to go out. And when we're suffering, we often feel like it'll never end. But Peter reminds us right here, after you have suffered a little while. So just remember, whatever you're going through tonight, <coughs> it's not going to be forever, right? If you're out there and you're listening and you're sick and you got an illness and it's terminal. It's not going to be forever. You'll, you'll receive your reward. You'll be in the presence of God. Whatever personal struggles you're going through, not going to be forever. But we can prevent a lot of this stuff from going in, on in our life by just serving the Lord the way that we should. By keeping ourselves surrounded by people that we need to be around. By distancing ourselves from the world. And by be, walking in obedience to the scripture. We can, we can exclude some of that from our life. So while you may be personally attacked by the enemy, God will use that to perfect us. He, he himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Right? You know the scripture says everything works for the good of those who love the Lord. So as you're going through whatever you're going through tonight, it might hurt. You might be suffering a little bit. But man, just press in. Because next time you have to go through something, it's going to be a little bit easier. Amen? God works through our struggles to produce something in us. And that's to make you strong, firm, and steadfast. And when the next attack comes, it'll be a little bit easier to persevere because you'll be a little bit stronger. It's real easy to say, oh, I got a lot of faith until you have to exercise that faith, until you have to trust God. That's where the rubber meets the road. Faith is an action word. Amen. Right? right. Yeah. I mean, when I go to the gym four days a week. It wouldn't do me good to go down there and sit down in the office and talk to these two guys every morning. <laughs> right? I ain't going to help me any. I got to go work out, then I got to get on that treadmill. I went to the doctor today, and my cholesterol was 147 three months ago. It's 122 now. Yeah. I dropped 25 yeah. points in three months yeah. by just taking care of myself. Yeah. Right? But I got to go in there and exercise. You got to exercise your faith by opening your Bible, by coming to church, by praying to God, by submitting to Him, by trusting Him. 5.11 says, To Him be the power forever and ever. Amen. And God gets the praise, the honor, and glory. For everything, we need not ever take any praise, honor, or glory from ourselves. When, when I'm on that treadmill running, I'm crying out to God, Lord God, help me. But help me get to my goal, Lord. Right? First 10 or 15 minutes, I'm good, and then it starts hurting. Then I start crying out. Right? Because he's the only one that's going to get me through. If I rely on my own strength, I'll quit. There's been a couple times I just wanted to quit, but I said, no, Lord God, you bore that cross. I can handle this treadmill. And then I get that second win. And then I get my thing done. Cry out to him. 1 Peter 5, 12. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you that testifying that is, this is the true grace of God, stand fast in it. So Peter dictated a letter to Silas there. Uh, Silas wrote it, probably delivered it too. It says here, with the help of Silas, whom I regard faithful brother, I have written you this briefly. So more likely Silas was writing the letter, helping Peter out, and then there in 13 and 14, she who was ba in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends her greetings, and does, uh, and does, and so does son Mark. Give, greet one another with a kiss. Peace to all you who are in Christ. So to the elders, the elder closes with a charge and a benediction. The charge is greet one another with a kiss, right? So we're obligated for brotherly love. There's an obligation, a standing obligation for brotherly love in the church. No matter what we're going through, no matter what kind of day you have, no matter what, 
When we come into church, when we gather with the saints, we should greet one another. We should be happy to see one another, right? And the benediction is peace to you, all who are in Christ Jesus. And it's comforting, uh, it's a comforting word to the saints who are, in that time, were enduring affliction for the name of Christ. They were going through some stuff because of the name of Christ. And Peter was trying to tell them, hey, peace. If you remember 1 Peter 4.12, it says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. So Peter knew they were going through something. He had wrote them this letter to encourage them. The church was going through some persecution. There was there were some struggles, right? He was trying to encourage them. He was trying to uh, let them know that the peace of God is with them. And the words that Peter spoke are echoed today. The same words are echoed to you sitting here today. No matter what you're going through today, church, peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Right? There was persecution back then. People were going through things. Church has really been persecuted here lately with the, the giving us the hindrance on gathering together and all that. But peace to all of us in Christ Jesus. Amen. That's where our joy comes from. That's where our peace comes from. It doesn't matter what situations we may be dealing with. We know that we know that we know that He wouldn't bore our sins on that cross. Amen. Right? And that one day we're going to go be in His presence. And this old world that we're living in right now is going to burn. We don't have to be a part of it. Amen? Amen? Father, we come to you today. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to gather around your word. And we just pray, Lord God, that no matter what we're going through, Lord God, that we would exercise our faith, Lord. We pray that we would be humble. We pray that we would seek your face. And we know if we do, Lord God, we will experience that peace that surpasses all understanding. Bless our evening, Lord, and we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Thanks for tuning in.